Good morning and welcome to our King's Church online service. We are so pleased that you can join us today as Pastor Dave Edwards ministers. Part 11. Of Faith for a Great Future. Well, good morning, church. We are going to continue this morning in our series of messages, Faith for a Great Future. And I pray that you are settled in the fact that God has a great future for you and I as we move toward it. Nothing has changed. The plan and the purpose of God for our lives remains the same. And whilst we live in a world that has many uncertainties and many changes about it, the writer to the Hebrews settles our hearts by saying this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. His plan never changes. His word to us, his promises to us, his intentions for us are never changed or never altered by time or by circumstance. So listen, encourage yourself in the word of God. Encourage yourself in the promises of God. And I really do thank God that we do not fear the future, but we put our faith and our trust in the God who holds our future together. So we're going to continue today in that. And if you remember, last week we began by asking a question. The question was this, who is the one person in your life that speaks to you more than anybody else? It's a really important question that we need to answer well. When we consider this question, very often we've got lots of different answers initially. And they're all valid answers. Some answer the question, who is the one person in my life that speaks to me more than anybody else? They would deem that to be their wife or their husband. Others would say, well, it's my friend, the one person in my life that speaks to me more than anybody else is my friend, or it's my colleagues at work, or it's a family member. But as we began to explore this question, and as you really begin to examine your life and and look at the voices and the influences around you, you'll discover that the one person that speaks to you more than anybody else is you. It's not your husband, It's not your wife, it's not your friends or your family or even your colleagues at work, it's not even God. The one person that speaks to you more than anybody else is you. Now, if you and I are the one person that speaks to us more than anybody else, how important is it that we examine the content of the conversation that we're having with ourselves on a continual basis. It's very important that we examine that content. Do you know that inner voice, that voice of self, sometimes can be very condescending. It can be very critical, harsh, and condemning. And we can live under an oppressive voice. We can live under the oppressive voice of ourself that's very often outside of what God would speak to us and outside of the word and the promises of God. And we have to recognize this. We have to examine the content of that conversation that we have with ourselves on a continual basis because if it doesn't line up with God's word for our future, if it doesn't line up with God's word for our present and even for aspects of our past, then we have to bring it into line and we have to bring correction to it. Now today, we're going to look at Psalm 42. And what we're going to see in Psalm 42 is that David is having a conversation with himself. And just a simple examination of this psalm, we'll see that this man is 
really having a very difficult time. He's troubled inside. And all is not well with his soul. In Psalm 42, as we will see, we get to overhear David evaluate and assess the condition of his own soul. He examines the content of the conversation that he is having with himself. And then he corrects it and he brings adjustment. And this is what is important to us today to see. This is the whole motivation of this message for us to see and understand this morning. That firstly, David is having a conversation with himself in Psalm 42. But then secondly, and what's very important for us to understand, is to see how he evaluates what's happening within himself and how he brings correction to the conversation that he's having within himself that's causing him to be downcast and disquieted within himself. David does something in Psalm 42 that we all need to do on a continual basis and it's this. He interrupts the conversation that self is having with him. And he questions self about his poor condition, about being disquieted and downcast. Paul said this to believers that he was writing to. He said, in him, talking about Christ, in him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being. It is not God's will that any of us be downcast within our soul. It is not God's will that any of us be disquieted within ourselves. And that word disquieted in the original language means to be depressed, oppressed, and suppressed within ourselves. And very often when self is the predominant voice in our lives, when we, when we don't listen to God's word and when it doesn't dwell within us richly as we looked at last week, very often when self is the predominant voice, what happens? happens is we become disquieted, we become depressed, oppressed and suppressed within ourselves. What needs to happen is we need to examine the content of that conversation and we need to bring God's word in to correct it and God's word in to adjust it and to change it. So we're going to read Psalm 42, and we're going to see how David listens to himself and then how David examines the content of the conversation that self is having with him and then how he redirects this conversation, corrects it, changes it, and places his faith again back in to God. Let's read from Psalm uh, 42, and we'll read from verse 1 all the way through to verse 11, so the full chapter. Let's read it. It says this, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. What shall I come? When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hoping God... For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill of Mizar. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me. 
The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night his song shall be with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance. What an amazing psalm. What a terrific, intense experience and period in David's life. Now, when we look at at this psalm, when you take a, a close, detailed look at Psalm 42, what you see is that it is filled with personal pronouns. In fact, David makes 40 direct personal references to himself, consisting in the words of I, me, and my. What we're seeing in this psalm is that David is immersed in himself. He's being extremely introspective about the circumstances that are occurring round about him and within him. Not only do we find this psalm full of personal pronouns that are very self-absorbing, and in fact, they're in every verse. But also, in this psalm, when you look at it closely, David asks nine questions of himself, of God, and from the enemies that are surrounding about him. And he has no answer for these nine questions that he asks himself within this psalm. So he's deeply troubled. David in Psalm 42 is having a conversation with himself and the content of it all is largely unexamined. And it's causing him, this conversation is causing him to be downcast. That is the outcome of this conversation. That was the end result of all of these thoughts and imaginations and all of these conclusions that are being summed up within himself. The content of the conversation that David is having with himself about the circumstances that he's in is not a good one. Now when you look at this psalm, and you overview it, you see that David was troubled by three very real experiences. And they were all converging upon him all at once. Round about him. Bearing down on him. And wearing him out. The first very real troubling experience that David had to contend with was the apparent absence of of God. This was a very real experience and David knew the close fellowship of the presence of God in his life but in this period, in this season, in this moment of conversation and overflow of his heart, he's contending with the apparent absence of God. And then secondly to add to this, there was the constant opposition of man. And then sandwiched, sandwiching those two experiences together. Thirdly, there was the unrelenting presence of trials. Three pressing experiences all converging, all packed together in this moment in David's life in Psalm 42. And it just overflows from his heart. And this conversation that he's having with himself is all too much and it leads 
to his soul being downcast. It leads to his soul being disquieted. Self is speaking. Self is bringing and collecting all of the facts together. And it's like as if David is beating himself up. Self has got the predominant voice. Self is criticizing, analyzing, collecting everything together. And David uh, has to contend with the conclusion of it all. And it leaves him depressed and oppressed and suppressed in life. And it's a terrific situation to contend with. Let's think about these experiences for a moment and we'll go through them one by one to see how David begins to deal with this whole situation that is too much for him. And very uh, and many of the aspects that David had to contend with in this season of his life they're very apparent in our lives many times. Sometimes the very things that he struggled with, we struggled with, we struggle with and have struggled with. And the things that he contended with, we contend with. So there's things that we can learn as we go through these things today and look at how David responded to them. Firstly, let's look at this very real experience that he faced. The apparent absence of God. David in this time had become more aware of the absence of God than the abiding presence of God. Now as I've said, this was a man that had an incredibly close experience with the Lord. In Psalm 139, for instance, we hear him voice amazing words about how close he is to God and the fact that he could never ever leave God's presence. Psalm 139 verse 7 through to verse 12 says this, and this is David speaking a revelation given to him by God to secure him and to give him confidence about God's nearness. David says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. And if I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. David knew that he couldn't go anywhere from God's presence. David knew that God was everywhere. And that's why he asked the question, where can I go from your presence? And then he so wonderfully answers it in that detailed way. There's nowhere in all of the universe that can exclude me from your presence. But here in Psalm 42... It's almost as if David has lost the comfort of that revelation. It's almost as if David has lost sight of that wonderful promise. Why? Because his feelings and his experiences are defying the revelation that God had given him. And oh, how that happens in our lives God gives us a promise and assurance. I'll never leave you, Jesus said. I'll never forsake you. And then an experience in life comes that seems to eclipse the beauty and the brightness and the assurance of that wonderful word from Jesus. 
and we get eclipsed by a circumstance or a situation, a crisis that contradicts those very words, that very promise that Jesus has made and there's an apparent ab absence of God in our lives. And like David, we recoil. Like David, we get immersed in experience. We get, we get swept over and swept up by our feelings and our thoughts and our feelings. And that voice of self stands up and, and begins to interpret circumstance, interpret crises in the following way. And we get left, dejected. I'm feeling rejected and feeling as if God is a million miles away, just like this man did in this psalm. He knew, he knew how awful it feels to contend with the feeling of that apparent absence of God. And we do too. We've all been there in that situation, in this in this place of feeling abandoned but you know in spite of the circumstances in spite of the feelings in spite of any crisis the promise that Jesus has made I will never leave you I will never forsake you that remains true but David was struggling with that here in Psalm 42 he likens himself to a lost deer. A deer that was being hunted, panicking, on the run. A deer that was parched and exhausted from the chase of the trapper. He says, I'm thirsty for God like a hunted deer, a wounded deer. David is feeling abandoned and that's the imagery, that's the picture that he brings us in on when we read this psalm, this life psalm. This isn't a man sat under a tree writing poetry. This is a man right in the depths of life, writing about the, the hardships and the conflicts and, and the, the, the beatings of life experience. He's feeling lost. He's feeling abandoned. He's feeling the, 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 that God is absent. And that's his perspective because that's the conversation. That's the content of the conversation that this man is having with himself. In Psalm 42, David is listening to himself and not speaking to himself. And as he listens to himself, or as he listens to self, it's causing his soul to be disquieted. It's causing his soul to be downcast. Do you remember last week how I quoted that wonderful quote from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who said, have you ever realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself rather than speaking to yourself? Do you know, I think that Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones really un uh, uncovered a wonderful truth, a wonderful principle there. In that statement. And that, that's what was happening to David in Psalm 42. He was listening to himself rather than speaking to himself. And as he listened to self, its condemning voice, its critical voice, the collection of all the facts that it brought before him, it left him depressed, disquieted, and downcast. Listen, that is not God's will. That is not God's will for any believer. It really isn't. Do you know, as believers, we should be the happiest people in all of the world. We should be the most joyful. We should be the most radiant. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. 
He did not say, I've come, you know, that you might have a get-by life, a substandard life. No, that word life that Jesus uses in John chapter 10 is the very life of God. Jesus said, I want you to have the life of God in your life. I don't want you to be dominated by that voice of self that will pull you down and just collect all the facts and rub your nose in, in the facts that you can't, you know, do anything about. No, I want you to have the life of God within you, an abundant life, a victorious life, a reigning life that won't disquiet or cause your soul to be downcast. Listen to how different David was in Psalm 34, verse 1 to 3. This time in his life, he isn't listening to self. He's speaking to self. He says this, Psalm 34, verse 1 to verse 3, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. That is a man that is reigning in life. That is a man that is positioned correctly under the favor of God. That is a man that is taking the promises of God and implementing them and holding on to them and deciding to magnify magnify God in his life. It really is. But in Psalm 42, it's as if soul, his, uh, his soul is being ravaged by the voice of self and he's being oppressed and he's a captive to it. This is a dry season for David. This is a uh, a time where he feels fatigued and low. In verse 4 of Psalm 42, we see what David is feeding on. We see some of the content of the conversation that he's having with himself, and it's all in past experience that's long gone. Verse 4, let me read it to you. David is reminiscing about the past. He's going down memory lane. He says this, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise. With a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. David is downcast. One of the reasons why David is downcast is because he can't go and fellowship with the people of God anymore. He'd been exiled from his land. He'd been banished and the temple was off limits and he's, he's hungry to be with the people. He's been isolated spiritually and socially. And you know, in this present crisis. We haven't been able to meet together in the way that, that you know, we love in this, in this building together. We haven't been able to do that. Now, hopefully, we'll be able to resume that soon. But it's been a, a, a really difficult season, I know, for many of us. Just like David, David was longing just to be with the people of God. And he's looking back and he's having this conversation with himself. And as he reminisces and as he feeds his soul on that past joy of being with God's people, he becomes downcast. Do you know, sometimes we, we have to let go of those old, those old incidents in our lives, we have to let go of the past to take hold of what God has for us in the future. And sometimes the only positive way to move forward is to forget what we desperately want to remember. We have to bring closure sometimes, and it's not easy. It's not easy. David had to do this if he was going to move forward. 
into his future, if he was going to bring closure on this season in his life, if he was going to stop this disquieted, suppressed spirit that was trying to really break apart his soul, he had to bring closure on that, on the past. David, David was self-absorbed and it and, and, and as we look through this psalm, we see that he's introspective and he's examining and, and regurgitating and, and, and reminiscing on all of these old experiences that were in his life. Good, yes, but they weren't helping him to get through the present predicament that he was in. He challenged the content of the conversation that he had with himself. And when he did, transformation and change began to occur. And we'll see that in a moment as we get through and go on through this this word. Now, the next very real challenge that David faced after undergoing this experience of the apparent absence of God in his life, the next the next experience that was very real was that was that of the constant opposition of man david talks about an unrelenting oppression from people around about him continually questioning his faith in god and it was causing him despair Where is your God? That was the continual taunt. That was the continual challenge that voiced itself to David through others. Where is your God? Have you ever heard that that taunt? Have you ever been confronted with that challenge? Where is your God in light of what's happening? If God were real, he wouldn't have allowed this to happen. And the questions go on and the challenge is laid right out there and it causes us to be, it causes us, it causes us pain in our hearts because very often we don't have the answer to the challenge. And if, even if we did have the answer for the challenge, because it's from a spirit of unbelief, it would never be good enough anyway. People were contradicting David. People were challenging his faith with this confronting question, where is your God? Psalm 42, verse 3 and 4. David says this, my tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, where is your God? Imagine that. The state of this man's soul. My tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, where is your God? This was a tough time for David. In verse 10, he talks about this this barrage of questions attacking his faith. And he said, it's like my bones are being broken. This man was struggling with the onslaught. Not only the question that was continually occurring within himself, but around him there was so many questions that were being pointed at him and shot at him. A barrage of oppression from people. This was the man who said in Psalm 46 verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble but in Psalm 42 we don't talk we, he's not talking about a very present help in God he's not talking about a refuge that he can run into he's not talking about the nearness of God's presence in the troubling times in which he faces it's all bearing down on him and the content of the conversation that we he's having within himself is a very negative one, a very self-absorbing one. And this isn't a criticism 
This, this isn't, you know, to point the finger at David and say, hey, David, you should have known better. Certainly not. I think it's wonderful that, that, that the psalmist is so open with the intimate happenings in his life because it helps us, it, it leads us, and it encourages us and instructs us as to what to do when our souls are downcast and disquieted within ourselves. His tears had become his food day and night. He's struggling. He's struggling with the apparent absence of God. He's struggling with the constant opposition of man. And then finally, this this third aspect, this third pressing experience, he was also struggling with an unrelenting presence of trials. Psalm 42 verse 7 says this, and this is David talking again, deep calls unto deep. At the noise of your waterfalls, all your waves and billows have gone over me. This is the language of a man that's caught in a terrific storm and trial of life. All your breakers and waves, he says, have gone over me. What do we do? What do we do when we go through a time, when we face experiences, and when our feelings tell us that God is absent. What do we do? What do we do when there's a constant opposition around us, an oppressive opposition from man, from people, even loved ones that contend with us? Where is your God? An apparent absence of God, a constant contention from people around us, and then the ever-pressing trials that are there continually queued up against us. What do we do? I'll tell you what we do. We do what David did in this psalm. We begin speaking to ourselves instead of listening to ourselves. And this is what is so wonderful about Psalm 42. Don't ever think that Psalm 42 is a sob story of a man that can't get through life. No, Psalm 42 is not a sob story about a man that can't get through life. Psalm 42 is a a story of a man that's going through terrific difficulties, that's trying to contend with the conversation that's overpowering within himself, but It's not only a story and an account of a man that's going through difficult things. It's it's a wonderful testimony of a man that triumphs in God as he realigns his vision, as he realigns and, and inspects and corrects the conversation that is happening within himself. Over the first 10 verses in Psalm 42, David listens to himself. And the content of the conversation, as we have seen, is a despairing one. But then finally, in the last verse, verse 11, we hear David speak to himself. We hear David correct himself. We hear David bring closure on this this voice of self that has been so critical and despairing. And he says this in Psalm 42 verse 11, why are you downcast or why are you cast down, O my soul? That's how he starts verse 11 and he's not asking for an answer from his soul. He's, he's bringing closure to a conversation that self had been having, that predominant voice that had led his soul to be downcast. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul, and why are you disquieted within me, hoping God, he says. 
He brings change. Suddenly, he he, he brings closure to this whole period in his life by standing up within himself and redirecting his thoughts, redirecting his attitude, redirecting this conversation. He brings closure within himself and he says, now we're going to bring change and we're going to start to hope in God. We're not going to focus on, on imagery of my life being like a deer panting for water, my life in, in, in extreme circumstances, on the run, being chased, being hunted down. No, we're not going to focus on pictures and imagery like that anymore. We're not going to focus on the questions, where is God? No, David is bringing closure right at the end of this chapter in verse 11, and he, he brings closure by saying this, now come on, we've got a hope in God. Hope in God, he says, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. David wasn't content just to lie down and uh, commiserate with himself. David wasn't content just to listen to that voice of self as critical as it was, as damaging to his soul as it was, he wasn't content. He stood up in the face of it. And instead of allowing self to continue in its fruitful conversation with him, David stands up and he declares the word of God to himself. Hope in God. The psalm begins in despair. The psalm begins with a man parched and thirsty and at his wit's end. But the psalm doesn't, doesn't end there. The psalm ends with a man taking hold of himself and saying, now come on, hope in God. Hope in God. And then he begins to do something that he was so familiar with and brought him so much blessing and fruitfulness. He begins to praise God. He says this, for I shall yet praise him. That's what he says. That's how he brings closure to this period in his life. That's how he brings order, order to all of this inner noise. You know, when you... Uh, Look at the House of Commons and very often, you know, there's so many voices from opposing parties when they're having their meetings. And then the, the, the man who is in control, the Lord of the house, stands up and he, he bangs his hammer on his desk and he says, order! And with that one word, all of the opposing voices are silenced with that one word, order. Everything becomes quiet and orderly. Before David brings closure in verse 11, there was disorder. There was a conversation that was causing his soul to be downcast, causing him to be disquieted within himself. But the moment that he, be, that he stood up within himself and he says, hope in God, the moment that he stood up within himself and decided that he was going to praise God, decided that God was going to lift his countenance, was going to be the help of his countenance, the countenance of his life. The moment he did that, order, order came. And all of the, the noise within him was silenced. Let me ask you today, as we close our service, has your soul been downcast? Has your soul been disquieted within you? I can look back over many years as a Christian and on many occasions my soul has been downcast within me. My soul has been disquieted, depressed, suppressed, 
oppressed. And I've tried to find out why. And maybe my mind has, has concluded, well, it must be this reason. That's why I'm disquieted and downcast within myself. Or maybe it's because of this situation or this circumstance. And there may be, you know, valid reasons sometimes why we really take a hit in our emotions, of course. But very often, one of the main reasons why we are downcast within our soul, one of the main reasons why we are disquieted within ourselves is because, like David, we have not examined the content of the conversation that we're having with ourselves on a continual basis. And we just let self be the predominant voice. I'm going to continue next week and we're going to see how this operated in Paul's life. How he had to deal with that inner condemning voice that was really driving him to a place of despair. But when he realized that Jesus Christ was the one that died for him, Jesus Christ was the one that wanted to be the life in him, suddenly he was set free from that old critical damning voice that really wanted to be predominant. Today, you may be downcast in your soul. Do you know, I tell you, Jesus loves us so much. And he wants our lives to have such a rich quality. Jesus did not die on the cross. He didn't shed his blood. He wasn't raised from the dead on the third day for our souls to be downcast. That doesn't mean to say that we won't go through very difficult times. It doesn't mean to say that, you know, like circumstances won't come and afflict us. But even in the midst of the most difficult times, we can retain our life in God. We can retain a peace that passes understanding. We can retain a joy that knows no end, that becomes our strength. The joy of the Lord can be our strength. Maybe today you're disquieted within yourself. Do you know God is going to minister to you and he's going to, the Holy Spirit is going to do a new thing. He's going to do a new thing in your heart. And when you hear that self rising up within you to condemn you, when you hear self within you rising up, being critical, taking hold of your feelings and presenting all of the facts to show you that there's no great way ahead or no great future before you, it's then, like David, you have to take hold of yourself, stand up within yourself and say, be quiet, hoping God, hoping God, for yet I will praise him, the help and the health of my countenance. I'm going to pray right now and I'm going to pray for your soul. David said this, didn't he? On one occasion, and this is a man, this is where we should be in relation to speaking, our, speaking to ourselves and in relation to, to the Lord. He said, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. That's not a man listening to himself. That's a man speaking to himself, commanding himself. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. He's grabbing everything within him and he's focusing it on blessing the name of God. And that's where we need to be. And that's where we can be. We just take it. We just take it and receive it and walk with the Holy Spirit in it. And I tell you, our lives will be fruitful and blessed. And we will live in that joy, in that joy that Jesus has provided for us. Let me pray for you today. And um, then we'll just close our service and we'll just trust the Lord to really really ground us in this word, not intellectually, 
not intellectually, but within our day-to-day -day walk with him. Lord Jesus, I thank you today for your word. Lord, you know the condition of our soul. You know so many things pass through our soul, try to ravage it and break it apart and damage it. You know, just in the course of one day, how many feelings can go through our heart and mind? How many emotions we experience? And they can contradict so many times the wonderful word that you've spoken to us. They can contradict the promises that you have given us. But Holy Spirit, you live in us. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that as the teacher, you would teach us to walk in this new life, this life of God that Jesus has so richly provided for us. Holy Spirit, as the comforter today, you would comfort our souls and you would bring healing into areas of our lives that seem to be so ravaged. And I pray from this day forward that we would, like David, always place our hope in you, God, and we would be determined to praise you with our lips, just like he did. And like Paul said, we would fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. Church, I pray that you have been blessed by God's word today. And listen, I know that this is such a powerful, practical message. Just listen to it. Meditate on God's word. Look at other scriptures in relation to this. And let's let the word of God, like Paul said in Colossians 3, let the word of God dwell within us richly. Begin to recite it. Begin to remember it. Begin to allow the word of God to be your word in your life, bringing correction, direction, and clarity in all aspects regarding what's ahead. Every blessing, and um, I just trust that you're going to have a great week. Really, really hoping that again now, as things move forward, we can resume our meetings soon. We're trusting God for that. Wow, what a day that's going to be. But listen, have a great week. Continue to meditate on God's word and I'll see you again, same time, same place next week. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you have any prayer requests, would like to share a testimony or would like to give online, why not head over to our website, kings-church.org.uk. If you prayed the prayer of salvation today and would like us to contact you to help you with your next steps, please click on the Choose Jesus button of our website. Remember, you can stay connected at this time by staying in touch with your Connect and team leaders. If you are part of King's Church and are not yet connected, scroll down to our Connect Online section and we will be sure to get in touch. Thank you for tuning in. We look forward to meeting with you again very soon.